Yeah, I remember. That always goes to us. Do you want to survey Queen's questions? Oh, yeah, does anyone have any? That's a good, uh, good point. Anyone have any questions right off the bat? Try to answer. It's fine, too. Uh, I can teach, and then maybe I can, yeah, I can take some questions after. Hopefully, also, they won't be, though. Feel free to get snacks and everything. This is 20 minutes? 20 minutes? Yeah, about 20 minutes. <laughs> Give or take. Yeah. How long have you been studying this? So uh, last year I did a year-long project. Oh, excuse me, on the utilization of stem cell treatment, hematopoietic stem cell treatments. Um, that was a year-long project, but this one is probably just this semester. So about like four, five months about actual like stem cell misinformation. So a little, all about stem cells, but a little a couple different topics. How did you get interested in stem cells? Uh, I had a biology teacher, Dr. Sacco, who. Uh, taught me very well about biology then one day I just was researching I found stem cells and I actually did Dr. Fox's course over the summer which if anyone has children um, in high school who are interested or I even lower too who are interested in biology I would check her courses out it was it's pretty life-changing we're, we're gonna have an opportunity to do lab tours after this and you can just see the work that they do here every day and it's it's pretty awesome Hi, Mr. Bush. See you again. <laughs> We're just going to wait a couple more minutes, I think. Dad, you have the time? Or? It's uh, 6 o'clock. Right now it's Ramos. 6 o'clock. So. <laughs> my English teacher, Mr. Ramos. He's the man. I'm doing the project for you. Let's pause on the apple. Let's pause on our video. <laughs> John, what's pause on, 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 the on the apple? I want it so it continues the video. Which point might we hit? I don't know. I don't give know. Very often. Do I want to give an apple? Sorry. Let's pause on this one. But will it continue again, though? Is that a new video? You're making things awfully complicated. Keep it running. We'll just keep it running. I can get all the questions. I wish that. Alec, do you want to? Yes. It's, I think it's kind of cool that Mr. Bush and Ms. Matsubara are here. Elementary school teachers. How cool is that? It's crazy. I can't remember that. That's awesome. Hello, Victoria. No, I'm standing. I think get started to. I think it's time to get started. I think this is about everyone, more than I expected. So first off, thank you everyone for coming um, to support my Apex project. Um, thank you to Dr. Fox for having me here. This is a great area. Um, yeah, so just a couple disclaimers before we get into the stem cell and the information. I'm not a doctor, so I'm not here to give medical advice. I'm just here to present to you um, what I found in my research that I've been doing over these past couple months. Um, so yeah, so. If you guys don't know me, my name is Alec. I'm currently a senior at Chadwick High School. I'm doing my Apex project, which is a about a year long, depending on what teacher you have, um, project where we investigate a problem with society or something that we find interesting. Um, and then at the end, we do an Apex action. And so this is my action where I try to inform the community about the misinformation surrounding stem cells. So let's get right into it. First off, what are stem cells and where are we with the current state of stem cell research? So stem cells are actually unspecified cells that contain a unique biological ability to specify into many different cell types within the body, such as heart cells, liver cells, skin cells, etc. Now to understand stem cells a little more, I want to talk about the two main categories of stem cells. The first of which being an adult stem cell. So adult stem cells are found in human tissue. Now, because of this, they're a lot more limited in their capabilities to transform into many different cell types. For example, an adult stem cell within the liver can only transfer into liver cells, which is why they're not as therapeutically targeted. However, as of 2006, a doctor named Dr. Yamanaka found this way to transform adult stem cells to be pluripotent. Now, pluripotent essentially means that these stem cells can transform into many different cell types that they couldn't before. And these are called induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, which actually are more like embryonic stem cells, which is our second 
category of stem cells. So embryonic stem cells come from donated embryos and they are automatically pluripotent. So they have the capability to transform into many different cell types um, without any um, reprogramming that adult stem cells need. So where are we with the current state of stem cell research? Currently, the only FDA-approved stem cell therapy right now is a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Now, this only works for blood disorders. So even if people are advertising hematopoietic stem cell transplants, if it's, if it's anything other than for a blood disorder, it's probably not effective and it's definitely not FDA-approved. So these are essentially for blood disorders where a patient has either unhealthy or depleted bone marrow, hematopoietic stem cells will go into this patient and make healthy blood um, to cure them. Now, this being said though, there is a lot of promise out there right now in the stem cell research field. So for example, um, with discussions with my apex advisor, Dr. Fox, we talked about retinal treatments, for example, because retinal cells are super easy to replace, which makes stem cells a good target for them. This being said though, you can't just go around injecting stem cells into your eye and expect to cure blindness. <laughs> However, there's a lot of early stage clinical trials um, investigating retinal cells, neurodegen neurodegenerative disorders, and so on. But that does not mean that it's all effective, and that it's all safe right now. So this leads me right into my topic of misinformation. So everyone knows that misinformation is present in almost every academic field out there, even in non-academic fields. However, in the healthcare world, it has some extreme consequences on patients, both economic, physical, and even social. So as you guys can see here, this was from a study conducted in 2016 that found that this was the most popular headline when you search the word cancer on Facebook. Now I'll let you guys read this for yourself. It's pretty evident how stupid and kind of bogus it seems. <laughs> However, for a lot of people who either aren't as educated or maybe desperate for medical treatment, headlines such as this can have a large effect on them and therefore it can cause a lot of problems. So there's several types of misinformation out there right now. The first of which actually being accidental, which a lot of people don't anticipate. So this usually happens um, when there's errors in the editorial process of an article. So an article is intended to say something, but due to these errors, it says something else, and that misinformation spreads. The one that relates to stem cells the most actually is for-profit misinformation, where companies purposely skew information or present faulty results in trials to lure consumers in so that they can make money. Now, conspiracy and rumors are very similar to themselves. Um, conspiracy is essentially when people believe something to be true, which is usually based on faulty evidence or no evidence at all, and then they go on to spread that. And then rumors are, I mean, everyone knows what a rumor is, when someone spreads something that's not true, and but still it spreads misinformation, creating a domino effect. So I wanna play this quick activity with you guys really quickly where I'm gonna say a couple statements and you guys can either shout it out, just say fact or myth. So first off, embryonic stem cells usually come from aborted fetuses. Oh, it is in fact a myth. So embryonic stem cells come from the first stage of this is called an in vitro fertilization, where literally a sperm and an egg cell are mixed in a dish. And after about five days, it creates a blastocyst, which is about a bunch of 100 cells. And it would be at this stage where this blastocyst is planted into a woman and hopes to impregnate them. However, even then, the rejection percentage is super high. And, but anyway, after this cycle, there's a lot of leftover blastocysts. And so what they do with these blastocysts is with the consent of the couple, they freeze them and they donate them to stem cell research. However, I want to make it clear there is a potential for life to be created, except usually with the freezing process and even just the in vitro process in general, this potential is pretty low. So next, scientists are allowed to experiment with human cloning. No. False. You guys are great with this. <laughs> Essentially, every uh, research regulatory board out there has strict regulations on human cloning. No one is allowed to do it, but that being said, you know, there was that one case with the doctor in China who decided to break the rules, but still, it's illegal and you could receive harsh punishments for it. Okay, and then last, just all stem cells are immortal because that sometimes gets spread around. Once again, false. You guys are awesome. Um, so not all stem cells are immortal. Embryonic stem cells happen to be, or all, pretty much all pluripotent stem cells are immortal actually in media, which is pretty cool, which makes them really um, applicable to research. However, adult stem cells, which was that first category, uh, category I talked about, are not immortal and they die. So not all stem cells are immortal. 
Okay, so there are a couple main causes of this misinformation. The first of which just being the simple overhyping of stem cells. Now, this is when scientists either exaggerate the results or people write articles about um, properties of stem cells that simply aren't true. To give an example of this, everyone knows of COVID-19. Um, during COVID, there were several different articles saying that stem cells can cure or prevent COVID, which were completely faulty. Now, just to give a little more perspective on this was the main study that was cited in almost all these articles only used seven participants, and four, three of which were the placebo group. So four of which were actually only being treated with stem cells. So that just shows how faulty methods in a clinical trial can produce totally misleading results, but then these results are still used by media and spread around to spread this false information. Okay, another big part of this is consumer misunderstanding. Um, for example, there was a study conducted in a retinal clinic that found that 65.5% of patients thought that all clinical trials were FDA approved. Now, this might not seem like it's a huge problem, but it is because a way that these companies right now are intriguing patients is by saying that their product or their therapy or whatever they're offering is supported by clinical trials, and they say, go find it on clinicaltrials.gov. Now, this is a database where essentially all clinical trials are posted, but it wanna be clear that just because it's posted on this website, first of all, it doesn't mean that it's FDA approved because a lot of times it's not. And second of all, they can still have faulty methods, faulty results, and a lot of times they go unchecked. So just because companies say that doesn't mean it's valid, their product's valid, but unfortunately a lot of patients fall into that trap leading to consequences. So just to give um, an example of how prevalent this misinformation is, there was a study that evaluated all these articles um, related to stem cell use for a musculoskeletal condition, and they've actually found that 96% of these articles, it was 900 articles, so 96% about 896 articles thought or had at least one piece of misinformation. So there's a lot of different celebrities right now, if you guys have been checking out the news, who have been using stem cells and boasting about the stem cells treatment that I've got. One example, or a couple examples, William Shatner, Mel Gibson, and that MMA fighter, Sean O'Malley. Um, but unfortunately, especially with my younger generation, these celebrities have such a big influence on us. And you know, if we see something that a celebrity does, we're like, oh, why don't we try it out for ourselves? Which is a huge problem, just to give an example, William Shatner, the clinic that he was boasting about, actually just received its third FDA warning letter. So obviously, like, just because they do it doesn't mean it's a good thing. Um, and then athletes actually in particular, like Sean O'Malley, are shown to have a, one of the biggest um, influences on people when it comes to stem cell and just therapies in general, their misinformation, because athletes are always trying to find a competitive advantage. So they're gonna be willing to take these unproven therapies or these like um, maybe shady treatments to try to be better than their opponents. And unfortunately, especially with athletes with large, large following bases, um, they're just gonna affect everyone and spread this misinformation super easily. So this brings me into my topic of misuse. So why patients tend to misuse these unproven therapies and what consequences they may have. So a study found that these were the main common motives um, to alleviate pain first off, which is obviously a valid reason um, and then they actually found that a lot of patients were motivated by factors that weren't even medically supported or scientifically supported, which is probably the biggest problem that they found in this study. Um, and also just the belief that these stem cell treatments are superior to whichever other treatments are out there in the field, which is also a belief that is just not supported by a lot of the evidence based on how early we are in research. So a way that these companies right now also are using to lure their consumers is by YouTube ads and specifically by using personal anecdotes. So it's almost like a psychological thing that when humans see another stranger, even if it's a stranger in a position where they use something and they, they're reflecting on it in a positive manner, then we automatically tend to think that it would be positive for us. And so that's why these companies have started to use these anecdotes. As you can see here, a study found that 90% of YouTube ads with unapproved air, when, um, advertising unapproved therapies use these anecdotes to lure their consumers in. Now, like I said, these have a lot of consequences, and the main two categories that I want to talk about are economic and physical. The average cost of a stem cell therapy can be anywhere in between $5,000 to $50,000, even for the unproven therapies. So even though it might not have physical risks, it could be just a complete waste of money, and that, I mean, that's no joke right there. Then also, there was a Pew Research study um, that evaluated adverse effects from unproven stem cell therapies 
from 2004 to 2020, and these are some of the adverse effects they found. Blindness um, was one of the biggest ones, organ damage, infection, and even increased pain. So especially for treatments that their goal is to decrease pain, increased pain is uh, obviously one of the most saddest ones to see. So one of my main points of this presentation is to inform you guys on what strategies you can use to sort through this misinformation, what to look out for in terms of stem cell products right now, and then who's doing something about this. So there are a lot of common types of stem cell products right now. The first I want to oops, the first I want to talk about are stem cell creams. So biggest one right now is stem cell face creams. I believe like celebrities like Kim Kardashian have used these and you know posted about them and stuff. But there's two main types. The first of which was our um, animal and human containing stem cell creams. So these actually have the greatest capacity to be harmful to you because of they they actually might contain human stem cells in it. If they did, it's probably unlikely, but if they do, then that's gonna be the greatest risk, especially because right now, um, there's no evidence that says that human or animal stem cells on your skin will actually be beneficial. Now the second type of this, these creams are plant stem cell creams. Now what I found and actually learned about, which I thought was super funny, was that a lot of these creams are advertising that they use stem cells, but what they mean is the actual stem <laughs> of the plant. <laughs> so, wow. And so that's actually a common way that these creams are deceiving people, because essentially at that point you're just rubbing plant debris on your face, which I never looked into this, but you know maybe some plants would help. Who knows? It doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then also some creams might include in their ingredient section something called Mary Stem. Now Mary Stem is a, a location on plants where it has been shown to be, that's where most stem cells are located within plants. And so if they do include this, then it might actually have plant stem cells in it. But that being said, there's really no evidence that supports that putting plant stem cells on your face would actually do anything. So this is a graphic from Dr. Knopfler, who if you guys put your email down, I'll send you a lot of his resources. He's a UC Davis professor um, and a stem cell scientist who spreads really good digestible information about this topic. And so he made this funny graphic saying what happens before and after you put fruit stem cell cream on your face. <laughs> Obviously you're not gonna grow fruit on your face, but that, he's just trying to emphasize the silly idea that when you put fruit stem cells on your face, you know, they're gonna be differentiating into fruit stem cells. So who knows if that's actually gonna affect your stem cells at all. And once again, everything that involves the word stem cells in it is pretty expensive. So even if it doesn't do anything, it's just a waste of money. There's also a bunch of stem cell supplements out there right now, you know, promoting that you know, they can make you not age, they can activate your stem cells, a lot of stuff along those lines, but you guys have probably noticed right now, it's, most of it's all just baloney. Um, especially the ones that say that they contain living stem cells within these pills, it's pretty impossible or super difficult to maintain living cells outside of their media, so I don't really know how that's even possible. Um, and then especially the ones that say they activate your stem cells, right now the only really promising way to activate your stem cells is in a hospital where they treat you with a lot of heavy drugs and chemicals. So um, it's really unlikely that a supplement will be doing anything of that sort. Um, I'm not commenting on you know this, I know I have a brand there, I'm not commenting on them specifically, but just all stem cells, all still, all stem cell supplements in general, just be cautious. And then a lot of common ones, you know, I was talking to my parents and Miss Kathy here, about these injections, um, especially for your knee is the most common one right now. Um, right now, unfortunately, all the evidence right there is super conflicting. So there's evidence saying there's benefits, there's evidence saying there's non-benefits. Right now, there's probably the most rigorous trial relating to this by the Mayo Clinic, which is it's early in its stages, but it's shown absolutely no benefit to injecting. This was for bone marrow cells, bone marrow stem cells into your knee. So my opinion, no one has to follow me, I wanna make that clear. My opinion is that it's just way too early um, in the stem cell research field to see that these could actually be doing anything. And then once again, these are expected thousands of dollars, so it could just be a complete waste. So, you know, I've been talking about all this misinformation out there, but I also want to promote good sources of information. One of them being the FDA, as many people know, they are right now the front runner in stem cell regulatory, even though sometimes politics can be getting caught up in them. Um, they do their best to regulate all these unproven therapies. Um, the ISSCR has very stringent ethical policies, so if that's something you're concerned about, there's a lot of good resources to check out on them. Um, they're also very aware of what's going on um, in terms of the unproven therapies, so they have a lot of resources directed towards that. 
Um, the National Institute of Health, many people know, just a really good source of credible information, particularly relating to stem cells. And the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine was actually one of the front runners in the nation in terms of stem cell research right here in California. So, you know, that's our local team right there. So check them out. They have a lot of really good information. Okay, and then I just want to give an example of something. Like I said, if you sign up on your email, I'll give you all this in an email. But something called the Jadad scoring technique, which is actually for clinical trials, how to evaluate them. Um, what it does is it gives you a scoring of one through five. You just kind of go through like a checkbox, and it makes it super easy to understand what everything is with definitions. And so this is just an example of how you can actually see if a clinical trial is valid and if it will support the company that is advertising this treatment. Okay, so a question that I had a lot when I was doing my research and something that you might have is, if there's so many of these unproven therapies out there and products, what is actually being done? Um, so the FDA, like I said, has the front runner role right now in terms of even issuing lawsuits, regulations, and warnings, but unfortunately, a lot of these businesses are simply just finding loopholes in all of the, regula um, all of the FDA's guidance. Um, for example, there's a loophole where if the company in extracts stem cells from an individual and doesn't modify in any way, that is allowed. And so a lot of companies are simply just doing that, which may or may not actually help a patient, but gets them money so they don't really care. Um, and then also patients have been doing a lot of things. For example, patients either affected by stem cells or who know actually about the science behind them have been expressing testimonials and there have been several class action lawsuits against um, biotech firms and then these shady clinics that some have been successful and some have been unsuccessful. And then finally, one that not many people think of and that could actually, in my opinion, play a larger role in this is the biotech industry. There was a study that said that out of stem cell manufacturers is the term, uh, is the term that I'll use, only 20% of them actually screen their clients for what they would be doing with the stem cells. And obviously, if you start at the top of these stem cell manufacturers and if they were harsher on their clients for how they're gonna be using these stem cells, then it wouldn't all fall on the FDA to regulate these treatments. It would be a lot more of a streamlined process. Thank you guys for listening. Um, Dr. Fox is going to be leading some lab tours. I'll probably tag along because it's a super sick lab. If you have any questions, <laughs> let me know. She can answer all the science questions. I can do my best, but I mean, she's a stem cell scientist, so it's probably best to direct them to her. But if you have any questions about my research process or more my research on information, just direct them towards me. How about a question based on past research? Like for example, you mentioned like what would be a benefit of stem cells? Like does does do stem cells have any benefit? Yeah, like I talked about actually, was the FDA approved? <laughs> no, but like an example, like a concrete example. Yeah, like remember when I said the blood disorders? Oh, blood disorders. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Long day. Just want to make sure you knew who he was talking about. Good job, Alec. Way to go, son. I mean, it kind of depends what side you're on, right? Like some people, and right now the biggest debate is probably around embryonic stem cells right. due to like the abortion thing. Um, you know, people who are more religious or sometimes more conservative are gonna be against embryonic stem cell research, but the facts of the case right now is that actually there's a very minimal amount of embryonic stem cell research actually going on, but unfortunately that's gonna taint a lot of the public's view into all stem cell research. And so, yeah, there definitely is different sides of the table that are arguing which can hinder the stem cell research process. Like, I'm kind of stuck with one pretty much no um, because um, the advent of IPS technology means that most stem cell researchers are not using embryonic stem cells anymore. So stem cell researchers, um, when I first came into this field it was actually kind of terrifying. Um, you were frightened for your life actually sometimes. Mm -hmm. I have heard nothing for years since IPS cells. Um, and I would never tell people what I did because I didn't know if I met someone on the bus or what, you know, I didn't know, particularly in America. In England it was fine, um, but in America I would never tell anybody what I did. Um, it was very charged. Um, now it's not an issue. The issue is with human fetal research because it comes from the fetal tissue. I, um, at USC was connected to that because I was the vice chair of the ESCO committee. And the ESCO committee reviews all research involving embryos and fetal tissue. 
So I, through that committee, even after the issues with the ESLs dissipated, we then had a new round of fears with the FIFA work. And actually, you probably remember the Planned Parenthood Veritas project mm -hmm. sting where they interviewed um, companies that harvest and I want to say sell, quote unquote, human fetal cells. Well, actually, one of those companies was housed in my lab. Mm -hmm. So um, but they're not, they're actually, that part of the work is nonprofit because they're not allowed to have it on a for profit basis. Mm -hmm. and Cells to cover the media that they grow them in and package them and send them. So there's no profit was ever made from the human fetal work. It was a service to prevent multiple individual labs going to the clinics individually and harassing them. So it was basically they would be a provider because the tissue is going to be incinerated. Mm -hmm. So they would collect the tissue on, and it was all done under proper consent. And then they would harvest the cells out and distribute them. And there was a small fee just for the time and materials, but there was no profit ever made from that. So we approved that as an escrow committee, and we allowed that the, there were three providers who were in the Veritas sting and were testified at Congress. One of those labs, we gave them space in my lab. I fought USC for it for a year, but we did it because no one would house them. They couldn't get housing anywhere because of what they did. Um, and then when that Project Veritas came out, they were basically bankrupt in, um, with legal fees in Congress, but none of the companies were found with any wrongdoing because they were not breaking any laws. And we knew they weren't because they had undergone all this ethical review. You can't just do that work. You have to have multiple ethical approvals. Um, and there was no, so, so that's the, where the ethics are now, is with the human fetal stuff. It's moved on from the embryonic stuff, because no one's really doing embryonic stem cell research anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it is still very frightening, in that if you are connected to those companies in any way, I'm not now, because I don't do, in my own private life, we don't do that work. And I never did the work personally, mm -hmm. but we reviewed it ethically to make sure that it was meeting all legal requirements, and then we gave a space for the cell processing. Mm -hmm. So that was how I was connected to it. But you would never say, you know, you're on the bus with someone, you just wouldn't tell them what to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not like that anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. The, the slide you showed about the knee with the yeah. stem I know that here in the South Bay, there's some place that is very popular for things like elbows and shoulders. Are you saying that those are not really, I mean, that's probably the same as a knee? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's all up to, you know, clinic by clinic, but just right now, I mean, if, if something was actually approved, or like not approved, but if something was valid, then all the evidence should be pointing in its favor and it would actually be FDA approved. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that like, every clinic out there's fault because there could yeah. be enough clinics, but right now, like, FDA, like, if each stem cell knee or, or um, injection was effective and safe, then there's a reason why it should be FDA approved, but the fact that so it's not it, FDA approved, okay, so the fact that not all clinical trials right now are pointing towards knee injections, that's why I would be cautious, but everyone can make There are many of those clinics in the South Bay. Right. There's, I passed one on the way in. Right. It, Boils my blood. Um, unless they are doing bone marrow transplants, they have zero evidence for any therapy they're offering. Mm -hmm. And I, cell transplantation therapies for the most part have not worked. Um, and I don't really see that changing. Um, just the biology of transplanting attached cells. The, the blood cells have a unique biology that enables them to be moved around and to hone back to where they should be in the body. Attached cells cannot do that. When you remove them from their scaffold, they're actually designed not to move because if they move, that's how you get metastatic cancer. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't <coughs> personally, not that it won't happen, but I don't see anything. People have been looking at this for a long time. I don't see anything in biology right now that is going to make the transplantation of adherent attached cells, solid tissue. I don't see that working. Mm -hmm. So unless it's a bone marrow transplant, there is 
Um, in the example of like the blood context for stem cell transport, is that like a one-time treatment, or do people have to like get treatments like monthly? I honestly don't know actually about that. Maybe Dr. Fox would know. What's that? Like, if someone is using stem cell transplants to for the purpose of blood, blood is that like a one-time treatment, or is that like something you do your whole life? Um, it. I'm not sure what the dosing is, but once you have repopulated the bone marrow, you don't have to have more treatments. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure how many treatments. It's going to vary on weight and also the, the quality of the stem cells. And there are tricks to improve their survival and honing. But once you have repopulated your bone marrow and spleen, you don't, you don't need to keep having treatments. No one has any more questions, and uh, I'm just free right now.